G'day, welcome back to my Swan Diary. Today we're going to look at understanding problem solving. In particular, using the DeMake framework from Lean Six Sigma and some tips on implementing strategies. But you might be asking yourself, why on earth do I need to know or understand problem solving mechanics in the first place? Isn't that for business people? Well, there's good use for it in OEs. With overexcitabilities, you've probably got your own OE profile and your own issues in your own home with people you love, or maybe your own workplace with colleagues. You get the idea. Your life is your life and your problems are gonna be unique to you. And that's why it's really important to define those problems properly so you can get to the root causes of them and implement solutions that are effective. I'll give you one example of a problem which might have several root causes if you have overexcitabilities, and that's sleeplessness. So if you can't get to sleep, it could be any number of causes. You could have existential worry, in which case you're not sleeping because there's too many things on your mind. You could have tactile sensitivity, in which case you're not sleeping because perhaps your mattress is too uncomfortable. Or maybe you've just got psychomotor OE and you've got too much energy and you need a different sleep cycle to everybody else. If you don't understand the nature of where your sleepness is coming from, you can't implement a proper solution. So for someone who has tactile sensitivity, the answer may need to be go out and spend some money on a new mattress, a good quality one, and perhaps some new bedding. However, if you've got psychomotor OE, that might be a complete waste of your time and money. So as a working person, it is really important to get to the root cause of your issues because you don't want to go spending money on solutions that just won't work. The DEMAKE framework comes from Lean Six Sigma, and it is an acronym like many other things in life, which stands for define measure, analyze, improve, and control. So do what do we mean by those components? Define means outline what your problems are. Get a pen and paper and list them all down. But don't just list the problem. List the attributes to each of your problems. So who are you affecting? When is the problem happening? So if, say, you're pacing, Who's bothered by it? Is it affecting your health? Or is it just annoying the people around you? When is that happening? So are you doing it at a particular time of day? Or is it in relation to a trigger or a stress? It's very important to write those things down so we can start getting to the bottom of the problem. The next step is to measure, and that literally does mean measure the size of your problem. If you're pacing, use a pedometer. If you're not sleeping, Find out how many hours you are sleeping. So the three things that you want to take into account when you measure are not only the size, but also the severity and the risk. The third part of to make is analyze. That means identifying the root cause of your problem. Now with to make, we tend to use the Socratic method, which means asking why. And there is a technique called the five whys, which will assure that basically you get to the bottom of any problem. And all that involves is just saying, why is this happening? So why am I pacing? Because I get stressed. Why am I getting stressed? Um, I don't know. That's up to you. The fourth step is improve which means actually implement a solution or a strategy. Now, most of the time, once you've properly defined your problem and you've gotten to the root cause, finding a strategy is really simple. And we'll talk about um, some strategies that may already exist out there uh, and some other strategy issues. Finally, the last step is control. Because just because you put a solution in place doesn't mean that it's actually gonna work. You actually need to measure it afterwards to make sure that it actually fixes the problem. So that means monitoring how you're going, watching to see if you're sleeping more, if you're trying to deal with that problem, or maybe you're eating more healthily. It may involve practice. So perhaps your issues are around speaking with other people or social anxiety, and perhaps you need to get out there and practice your habits a little bit more. 
Or maybe you're practicing quitting or giving up something that's addictive. And that too is a practice because it's forming a new habit. Another control can also be to socialize others with, with your issue. So, you know, your friends and family, those closest to you, perhaps if you're a continual scratcher, you might ask them, look, if you see me scratching, can you just tell me to stop? If you see me picking, can you please ask me to stop? So other people can be a form of control as well because they can help you and can support you through this and can help monitor you as well. Strategy and solution design for me involved going to things that already existed. So bits of psychology, bits of business techniques and other random bits off the internet of information that I could get my hands on. Uh, but you can go out and do your own strategy searching as well. For example, if you're a nail biter, there's already stuff out there that you can get that you can paint on your nails or the solutions on the internet. Um, so perhaps you've only got one or two problems and there's already strategies in place. Uh, particularly for things like addiction, there's already quit programs and those sorts of things. So you can leverage things from the external world or structures that are already in place to implement your solutions. So my tips for making your OE solutions work for you are use your interests as motivations. Don't rail against your hobbies or the things that you're fascinated by. Try and use them to motivate you uh, to do good work. So it might be the fact that uh, while you're uh, going on a walk to try and calm down with your stress, perhaps you can reward yourself with a podcast on your favorite topic while you do that. There's also trying to do things that deliver value to you. So that can be practical value, um, one strategy I like to use for my psychomotor OE is if I'm feeling twitchy, go and stack the dishwasher or do something helpful around the house and make uh, the housework a little bit lighter. You can also do ethical things. Perhaps you have too much energy and you use your hands all the time and you take up knitting. Well, perhaps you could knit for charity and make scarves for a children's organisation or something. Or you can simply do something for yourself and reward yourself on the grounds of needing a mental health break. Perhaps part of your strategy is to relax yourself and have you know hot baths on a regular occasion because you don't sleep very well and you need to relax your body. So try and do things that deliver value either practically to others or yourself. And my last tip for this part is to reveal to others on a needs basis and you do you. So I talked about socializing others with your issues um, so they can help control you when you're trying to break habits. Um, I personally don't feel the need to tell everything about my OEs to everybody, um, even though I'm doing a YouTube series, so it's really no secret. However, if I was only uh, trying to deal with one problem, say at work, I might just tell my workmates about that one issue. So perhaps I'm still chewing on pens and I really need to stop. Um, I would just say, look, if you catch me chewing on something, can you please tell me to cut it out? They don't need to know about all your OEs, but you know you can just tell them the part that's relevant. But I would suggest strongly that you should at least tell the people that you live with um, about all your overexcitabilities and share with them, because after all, they're living with your OEs too. So my last three tips. Once you've figured out what your problems are and what solutions that you're gonna put in place, prioritize yourself an action plan. That's really important. Take into account things that uh, have an effect on your life or your health or others. And that's why you really need to do that measurement of the severity and the risk of the size of your problems. So use that to inform you of what problems you're gonna attack first. And you should really make it the ones that are causing you the most uh, risk, um, or it's posing risk to your life or your health or to others. The second tip I have is on the opposite scale of that, if it ain't broken, don't try and fix it. You know, if it's working for you, let it go. And if it isn't causing you any great problems, I wouldn't try and prioritize it unless you've got really nothing else better to do with your time. Concentrate on the things that are affecting you and learn to forgive yourself and let go of the things that aren't really causing an issue. And my final tip for implementing strategies is what I like to call the Dalton proposition. 
So if you've seen Roadhouse um, and you're familiar with that movie with Patrick Swayze, you'll know that when he starts working as a bouncer in that bar, he tells all the other bouncers, be nice. Again, be nice. And he keeps repeating it until it's time to not be nice, which is very far down the line for good old Dalton. But that's what I call the Dalton proposition. Be nice. In all your solution design, remember to be nice to yourself and to others. And if you're angry or you need a slightly more adult or funnier phrase, my personal go-to for that is to flip it around and say, don't be an expletive. Um, that's just for me because I know when I'm particularly cranky and pissed off, um, be nice will just aggravate me further. So if you need <laughs> another version of that because be nice is just too friendly, try don't be an expletive. So that's all today from me about problem solving and problem solving techniques uh, and the importance of getting to the root cause of your problem. The next video will be about psychomotor and we're going to go in depth into the, the five OEs in the next videos. But for now, it's time for me to call out my celebrity OE person of the day. Today's celebrity OE call out, and I don't know if they have OE or not, we're just speculating to raise discussion, is Heston Blumenthal, my favourite chef. Uh, Heston is a, a representation of intellect and imagination and the power of that combined. But the reason why I think Heston might have OEs is the way he describes his experience with cooking and his general curiosity and delight with food. So Heston's interest in cooking began when he went to France with his family and he described the experience uh, as being a whole multi-sensory experience. The sound of the fountains and cicadas, the heavy smell of the lavender and the sight of the waiters carving lamb at the table. And clearly that's something that's never escaped Heston. He clearly has a great love of all the senses and he sees food as one of the few experiences that truly engages all of your senses. So if anyone has sensory OE, I reckon it's old Heston. He's clearly very, very intellectual and he has been given an art, made an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, and his love of all things scientific and chemical translates through into the great creations uh, that he makes, as well as his huge and vivid imagination, which is rich and detailed as much as his apparent memories. Now, Heston talks about food insofar as it recalls memories, and a lot of his uh, specials and his fantastic feasts are centered around his own childhood memories, which seem to be very rich and very detailed. So that's sort of another indicator that perhaps he does have OE. He's also talked about food uh, and the molecular level. He likes food pairings and you know the, the combinations of flavors determined by their chemical profile. But he's also said that there's as much chance of mucking that up as getting it right and nothing beats a chef's intuition. So clearly he's a bit of one and the other as well. And like most people with OE who are quite smart, we like to hedge our bets on both sides and see multiple perspectives. So Heston, for being so fully engaged with your intellect, your imagination and your senses and also always being willing to play and have a try and be unafraid of failure, I'm giving a shout out to you. However, remember, I am not an expert on Heston or OEs. I'm just one person with OEs trying to share my ideas in order to spread some happiness. See you later.